um, yes, since uh, we are all here, I would like to say an official good morning, good afternoon, happy Monday, dear participants. Thank you so much for joining today. Ewan Newman and Team Dev Canada is happy to collaborate and co-organize the Investing in Gender Responsive Companies event. This event is hosted by We Empower G7 program in support of Women Empowerment Principles. My name is Diana and I will be happy to moderate today's discussion. Um, and we hope it will be an interactive one. Uh, we are hoping that you'll continue chatting via our Zoom chat and ask all the questions you want. We will be happy to receive them and respond to them throughout the discussion. Today we have an exciting panel and it's very, um, we are very thankful for our panelists and distinguished guests to join today's discussion. Here's our program, and um, we hope we will succeed everything we wanted to um, deliver through our opening remarks and uh, presentations. I just want to mention that investing with purpose has never been more important. The financial sector, stock exchanges, central banks, pension funds, all play an influential role in leveraging the power of capital markets to steer companies and regulators and, and improvement in corporate culture and business environments that work for everyone and ultimately contributing to gender equality. Today's event will highlight the women empowerment principles as a strategy for investors to steer such practices. The Women Empowerment Principles are a set of seven principles offering actionable guidance to businesses and other organizations on how to promote gender equality and women empowerment in the workplace, marketplace, and community. And now, without any further ado, I would like to invite um, Anita Batia, Deputy Executive Director of UN Women, to kick us off and to mention why the topic of today, um, investing in gender responsive companies is so important in the COVID framework and also in um, the future development and the advocacy of gender equality and women economic empowerment. Dianita, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Diana. Can you hear me well? Yes, we do. Okay, great. Well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me to join you today on this discussion on investing in gender responsive companies. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here uh, with our partner FinDev, uh, with uh, We Empower, with ILO, and of course, want to acknowledge the um, amazing uh, support that we received from the European Union which uh, has enabled us to grow the women's empowerment principles and the work associated with this to a critical stage and to a critical mass where it can actually begin to deliver real benefits for women and girls on the ground. It's a really timely moment to be having this conversation. Uh, we are now um, six months into the most cataclysmic event that we have witnessed in our uh, lifetimes in terms of a health crisis as well as uh, an economic crisis. And one of the things that has become crystal clear over the last few months is the disproportionate impact that this pandemic is having on women and girls. There are many aspects of women's lives that have been touched negatively by the pandemic, principally income, health and security. And income has been badly affected for several reasons. First, because many of the sectors that have been affected by the pandemic and the crisis are heavily feminized and the proportion of women working in these sectors such as retail, hospitality, uh, et cetera, have a very large proportion of women. Second, uh, in many countries, the informal sector, which also counts with a very large proportion of women in it, has grown exponentially because of the crisis. Third, we know that women bear 
a disproportionate portion of the care burden. And so we have seen that even before the pandemic, women were doing three times as much unpaid care work as men. And this, of course, has ballooned during the crisis as women manage the multiple demands of uh, children, homework, their own work, housework, taking care of the elderly, which of course is making it very difficult for women to remain as engaged in the workplace as before. And now over the last month, there has been emerging data about return to work. And we are seeing that there is a big disparity first between rich and poor in terms of being able to return to work, but second and most important for our conversation today, uh, uh, there is a big disparity in men and women going back to work and many women are finding very simply that they cannot make their jobs work during the pandemic. And so we are seeing data coming in, which is very worrying, which shows that as many as one in four women are considering actually downshifting their careers or leaving the workplace due to the impact of COVID-19. And we know from previous crises, even though they were much smaller in scale, but we know from the Ebola crisis and other such shocks um, that it is very difficult when a woman steps off the work track to actually go back to work. So this is not something that is going to be a temporary effect. This will have long-term consequential impacts on a woman's income and on her family's income and therefore on the community and ultimately on the country. So there is a really strong economic case for ensuring that women actually remain engaged and that through the pandemic, as governments think through the different features of their stimulus packages, and as the private sector and as companies think through what measures they need, that these measures take into account the need to ensure strong and rising female labor force participation. We know that countries which have more gender equality can be stronger and more productive. And it is with this lens that we must approach today's topic of investing in gender responsive companies. The kind of multi-stakeholder collaboration that has been made possible because of WEBS is exactly the kind of initiative that we need to help grow. Investors, in fact, play a very powerful role because their money can steer the social um, changes that are needed. And uh, we also know from experience that when investors consider the triple bottom line, they actually are creating companies that are stronger, more sustainable, and are able to play their fair and appropriate share in creating just and inclusive societies. So holding companies to this standard is really what gender lens investing is all about. We know that there is a huge and growing market for sustainable investing and that pension funds and institutional investors are looking for assets that um, will generate these uh, uh, double and triple bottom lines. And we are very pleased that the WEPS program enables this kind of attention to uh, gender equality. So uh, let me conclude by just saying that I'm delighted on behalf of UN Women to be able to be with you today and to be able to, with the partners we have in this program, uh, really just encourage an acceleration of the progress that we have begun to see and we think that um, uh, institutions like FinDev actually have a very important role to play because in upholding these standards of gender responsive investing, they can not only do good with their own money, but they can serve as a role model for other DFIs that are looking uh, to also have um, substantial social impact. Thank you very much, Diane, and um, great to be here with um, all of our partners today. Over. Thank you so much, DD, and thank you for highlighting the problems and concerns that we have today and uh, 
uh, making the reference to the lesson learned from previous crisis. Only last week I read that around one fourth of working um, mothers that have care responsibilities in US are considering to leave uh, the work. Um, and this will change forever. Obviously, the uh, job status and the um, achievements uh, achieved already in the, on the job market, on, also on the hierarchical uh, management position in US. And this is just as an example, but we, we are also referring to countries around the world because we are all in this pandemic. Uh, and it's not only one country, but we are all on this together. And we need to consider how to build back better considering all the lessons learned as well. And um, the Development Finance Institute Canada um, works um, and aims of combating poverty through economic growth by focusing on three main themes and it's economic development through job creation, uh, women economic empowerment and climate change mitigation. And I would like to invite Chief Investment Officer, FinDev Canada, Paolo Martelli, to share some experiences and points from their um, point of view that they also see in Canada and in the countries where they have programmatic efforts. So, um, Paolo, over to you. Thank you, Diana. Hello, everyone. I'm Paolo Martelli, Chief Investment Officer of FinDev Canada. I'm going to take a few moments to talk about who we are what we do and how we put our focus on gender into practice. First off, we, uh, FINDEF Canada is, is Canada's DFI, Canada's Development Finance Institution. We advance development through either lending or investing uh, in the private sector. So that means we use either debt or equity uh, instruments to invest in, in various companies. The markets we look at are Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean. When we invest, we look at not just financial returns and risk, but we also look at the development impact of our transactions, how our transactions improve the lives of people on the ground. The three main aspects that we look at when we're looking at, at the development impact of our transactions are first, local market development. So we want to support local markets, local entrepreneurs, and so forth to the maximum extent possible. We try to support investments that mitigate and adapt to the effects of climate change. And third, and then most important for us, is that we support transactions that help women's economic empowerment. I want to talk a few minutes about how we try to support women's economic empowerment and, and gender inclusion. First off at FinDev Canada, with regards to our investments, 100% of the transactions that we do have a gender lens applied to them. What does this mean? In, in part, it means we look at how the transaction impacts the lives of women on the ground. We look at how our clients, the um, affect them either through the products or services they provide, through the representation of women uh, at their employees, in management, at the board, um, and we look at, at, at what they do overall. Um, we also ask ourselves, how can we help our clients do better? How can we help them to be more inclusive? And we have different tools uh, and specialists to help us with that. In addition, FinDev Canada does important external work with our peers to help further equality. So for example, even though FinDev Canada started just a few years ago, we were a founding member of the 2X Challenge. This is an initiative that was set up with the other G7 DFIs to unlock resources to advance women's economic empowerment. As, as part of this group, we are proud to have helped to contribute to over $4.5 billion that has been committed since 2018. And this response includes not just development finance funds, but also funds from the private sector as well. Finally, I want to note that we also have important partnerships with many uh, organizations, including UN Women. FinDev Canada was the first DFI to have a partnership with UN Women, and FinDev Canada is committed to endorsing and promoting the women's empowerment principles. I want to conclude with, uh, with a final comment about the importance of partnership and, and collaboration. Even though we all might be interested in reducing in, in inequalities, we cannot do it alone. So for example, even though the women's empowerment principles might be fantastic, but if they are just left there on the shelf, on a website and nothing is done with them, they won't move the needle. We need to work together because we, uh, there are great examples when we collaborate. And I'm proud to have one of our clients speak with one of my colleagues about what they did with the, with the tool uh, and, and how they, they made various adjustments. 
At FinDev Canada, we are um, we look forward to continuing to collaborate with UN Women with clients such as Climate Investor One, and we look forward to continuing to support inclusive companies. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paolo, and thank you for highlighting the importance of actions and collaboration. Um, and this is um, this is something that we will continue. Uh, the discussion with um, uh, Anna Falk, Head of Women Empowerment uh, Secretariat, Johan Newman, Anne Marie Lavesque, Head of Gender and Impact from FinDev Canada. And you mentioned Claire Cummins, Head of Environmental, Social and Governance Climate Fund Managers. They will let us know how the collaboration is possible and what type of action that we all can do at the employee level and company level, um, we can start taking from today. So um, this said, Anna, please over to you to share why women empowerment principles. Thank you so much, Diana. And, and thank you so much, Anita, for joining and Paolo as well for your inspiring opening remarks. Um, I, I think that uh, we've been collaborating now with FinDev Canada for some time, and uh, it's, it's inspired me every time we get together and, and talk about how we can use the agenda lens investing as a mechanism and, and a tool to really drive implementation of the women's empowerment principles. Um, and I think that as uh, Anita was saying, it's, it's um, it's both about inspiring others um, as you are from FinDev Canada to really kind of lead, lead the way, um, but also then to among investors, but also to engage with uh, companies and, and really hold them to account. And I think this is the, the exciting part for us uh, to see that this tool is as gender lens investing is actually working. Um, why women's empowerment principles? The women's empowerment principles is a global framework. We are rolling it out in through all of our offices across UN Women uh, in more than 90 countries, uh, but we are also active in many other countries. So it's a global framework, um, but it's also a, a journey. Um, the companies can start from, from zero, they can start from um, where they have already been working for a few years. And we welcome anyone uh, independent of where they stand today uh, in terms of the journey towards gender equality and women's empowerment. Uh, it is a partnership um, as uh, FinDev Canada is one of our signatories. We work very closely and figuring out ways to, to drive this agenda and a network. We have nearly 4,000 companies across the world um, they range from startups, women entrepreneurs uh, that are leading with gender equality to uh, SMEs, multinationals. Uh, it's, it's a broad spectrum of different actors. It also includes chambers of commerce, women um, business associations. And the, the purpose is really to kind of create that ecosystem of um, companies that are all bought into this agenda so that we can achieve gender equality and women's empowerment for all women and girls. And um, we are um, currently working through, we have guidance on many of these different uh, topics. So uh, the Women's Empowerment Principle website is on webs.org. Uh, we are going, uh, I'm not going to go into the details of each principle today. But basically, we require higher level corporate leadership. We want the CEO to be in the lead and, and sign the principles. And then we have um, the following principles, gender equality in the workplace, uh, health, well-being and safety, education and training for women. That is about workplace issues. We also tackle uh, the marketplace issues, which is very, very important to look at the, this work from a supply chain perspective, that we have an opportunity to touch the women otherwise left behind so that we are holding to account, like we will hear from FinDev Canada, uh, that are working with the investees and holding them to account. We also hope that then these investees will hold their partners to account so that we can inflict change 
um, on the ground for women and girls that otherwise would be left behind and to bring them into to supply chains and into those activities. What is very exciting um, is also to work with women and girls in local communities. I think this is particularly relevant in these days of COVID-19 uh, to make sure we heard from Anita that there is a huge risk of irreversible um, um, changes that will not make women and girls part of the labor market. They have many of them are falling out. We see girls falling out of education because they don't have access to internet or to the devices. We, we see women taking hard decisions to uh, leave their workplace because of all the um, unpaid care work that is being put on their plate um, additionally. But also in, in the next few months, we will launch a M&E framework, a monitoring and evaluation framework for companies. And uh, with that also comes an action planning tool so more on this in December, but I just leave it now for everyone to anticipate uh, this framework and our action planning tool in, in December. Uh, I mentioned the journey, I wouldn't go into too much detail, but um, there is um, a process of getting involved with us in signing the principles uh, on webs.org slash join. Uh, but also we will hear from Anne-Marie talking about the gender gap analysis tool in a little bit. And, and that is also to kind of set your baseline and where are you today um, and to understand what else is to be done. And the action plan tool that we are working on will complement this and really help you to develop an action plan um, out of what you, you're learning from, from the tool. And um, as I was mentioning in Engage, um, it's really about activating all your business partners. And we understand today that investors are interested in making sure that their investment are um, as little risk as possible and as much gain as possible. And we know that with many gender inequality issues, this is um, boosting the, the risks. And uh, to minimize that, um, there's a lot of activities that need to, to take place. But also from a consumer end, we know that consumers are quite aware on uh, what brands, what companies are producing uh, products that they can align with, uh, with their values. And, and that those values are aligned with gender equality and women's empowerment. And uh, sustain and reporting is what we will cover a little bit in, in December when we launch our m &E framework. Um, and finally, if we can go to the last slide. Um, we have an exciting award that we have just launched last week. Um, we are targeting this time. So apologies for all the, the companies that have joined us today that are not based in the G7 or in the European Union. But this is the award uh, covering this region. Um, and um, I think Alicia can also put in the link on where you can find more information about the award. Uh, will also be announced in, in December. So i um, excited about these opportunities um, and thank you so much, Alicia. And I would like to hand it over to uh, Anne-Marie. Thank you so much, Anna. I, can, you, can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Uh, so good morning or good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, what a great way to start the week. Very excited to be here. Uh, so my role today is to tell you about uh, why and how the Syndap Canada used the Women's Empowerment Principles in its investment activities. So as my colleague Paolo mentioned earlier, Syndap Canada applies a gender lens to all its transactions. So it's really important for us to be able to rely on tried and tested frameworks that help us assess the company's level of commitment to gender equality, but also its strengths and potential blind spots when it comes to supporting and empowering women in their business operations. As a financial institution, it's equally important for us to be able to do that with the least amount of disruption to our clients while adding as much value as possible. And finally, as a small team, it's also important to find solutions that can save us time and resources. So that's why FinDev Canada decided to use the WEPS framework and its accompanying gender gap analysis tool. We really like the fact that uh, this is a user-friendly, 
internationally recognized methodology centered around seven principles, uh, which were designed with the private sector in mind. Uh, it's also available in multiple languages, which uh, makes it easy to use uh, worldwide uh, in our uh, investment operations. So since 2018, uh, we asked our potential clients to take the web gender gap analysis tool as part of our standard impact due diligence. The results provide us with, uh, as Anna mentioned, a high level baseline of the company's current performance across the seven web principles, which then feeds into our assessment of the impact profile of the transaction and makes it easy to track progress over time. Uh, if we can move on to the next slide, please. Um, the results uh, of, the, of the assessment tell us where companies currently stand on gender equality. Uh, but in fact, whether the results come back as beginner or leader is not really the point. Um, the point is really about getting to know the company better through this process and identify priorities for action that will build on the company's strengths uh, and address what needs to be improved. So for our impact and investment officers, the webs have proven to be a great conversation starter to have an open discussion with clients about where they are in their gender equality journey, uh, where they see themselves going, and how we could help. So in short, we try to use the webs not as an end in themselves, but as the beginning of the journey, which Anna referred to earlier. Uh, so let's take a look at a, at a concrete example, uh, maybe moving to the next slide. Uh, so this is a randomized uh, example of uh, WEP's tool results. Uh, as you can see, the way the results report is designed allows to identify in a very visual and impactful way uh, those areas of strength and those requiring further attention. In this fake example, uh, the company seems to benefit from a good level of leadership commitment for gender equality. Uh, it's also taking concrete steps to promote gender equality in the workplace, but the results also suggest it might be time for this company to turn its focus outwards on its customers, on its service providers, and nearby communities, while also considering additional solutions to support employees, including men, in their caregiving responsibilities, which is especially uh, topical now, as I need to mention, given uh, the impacts of the COVID crisis. So visuals like this really help us as an investor uh, build uh, gender action plans in collaboration with our clients that are really tailored made for them uh, and in a much uh, faster and simpler way. Um, similarly, it makes target setting and tracking much simpler. Each question of the tool holds a multitude of potential recommendations for action and concrete metrics to measure success. Uh, but one can also take a broader view and aim to improve across the board. Uh, one of our clients in Latin America, for example, decided that they wanted to move from improver to achiever within the next year. And so they prioritized those actions that could get them there uh, for their action plan. So how do our client companies feel about this? Uh, so far, we have received very positive feedback from clients about the tool. Uh, specifically, they appreciate how uh, user-friendly the tool is and how uh, easy and fast it is to take the assessment after previewing the questions. Uh, most of the concerns we get initially are about the confidentiality of the results. So it's really reassuring for them to know that the platform uh, is uh, strictly confidential. We've also observed that clients are very curious about their results and nearly all of them automatically want to know how they can improve. Uh, and so for companies that are just starting in this area, tackling gender issues in the workplace or in their business operations can seem like a daunting task. You know, where do I start? How is this relevant to my business? Surely this must be really complicated. So the web principles and the tool uh, are great to use with those companies because it's made with the private sector in mind. So it really helps to link gender equality to concrete business areas that deal, deal with in the day-to-day. -day. So strategy, workplace, employees, the marketplace and consumers, community relations, et cetera. Identifying areas of strength can also have a very powerful effect, especially for beginners. Uh, after taking the web, even complete beginners will often come out with at least a few areas of strength um, and we've observed clients reacting really well to those results. You know, okay, so we're already doing a few things right. So this must be doable. Uh, 
how, you know, what are the next steps? How do we improve? So it creates a really positive uh, mindset. Um, and at the other end of that, we've also seen clients who realize they did perhaps less well than they thought. And so the very precise diagnostic that they get enables them to zero in uh, on these areas that need uh, attention in a, you know, very quickly and efficiently. So since we started using the WEPS uh, principles in the gender gap analysis tool, I'm really happy to say that at least four potential current clients have become WEPS signatories. Uh, and one has even uh, started using it with their own investees. And uh, we're lucky enough to have them with us today to tell us about their experience. So um, without further ado, I'll, I'll hand uh, back over to Diana now so she can introduce Claire. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. Indeed, we found out about what are webs and how can it benefit um, your company. We also found out from Anne-Marie how and why FinDev Canada uses the Women Empowerment Principle. And now um, we would like to invite Claire Cummins, Head of Environmental Social Governance, Climate Fund Managers to share with us um, whatever, what is Climate Investor One and also how and why using the Women Empowerment Principle internal and with their clients help them in their progress to gender equality. Over to you, Claire. Thank you, Diana, and to my um, fellow speakers today. So um, both the words Climate Fund Managers and Climate Investor One have been mentioned um, so far. Basically, Climate Investor One is the first of our two funds that Climate Fund Managers manages. And um, with both our funds, we're focused on climate change adaptation and mitigation related technologies. Um, with the first fund that relates to renewable energies, and we are focused on emerging markets in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Um, and with the second fund, we are focused on water, sanitation, hygiene, and um, other, other related um, industry sectors as well, which also includes um, green shipping and green ports. Now, as a manager of investment vehicles, which is focused on climate change adaptation and mitigation, we recognized very early on that climate change is experienced differently between uh, men and women and boys and girls. And we know that climate change can have disproportionately more significant impacts on women and girls. And we, we also know that in the geographies where we're working, that uh, women and girls continue to face constraints when it comes to, for example, accessing basic services, uh, going to school, earning their livelihoods, owning property, and making decision, uh, participating in decision-making processes. And this prevents women and girls from reaching their full potential, and that in turn hinders the economic and, and social and human development of, of, the, of the country at large. And so for us, it's really important that gender and, and gender empowerment are central to, to everything we do. And therefore, man, mainstreaming of, of those concepts is, is, a logical, um, is a logical perspective to take to enable the, the funds and the investments we make to be successful. And this means that we try to design the projects in which we invest um, with gender in mind. Um, we try to be sensitive around the, the particular needs of women and girls in the way that we design and implement projects, whether that be through uh, stakeholder engagement and consultation with communities, whether it be in the assessment of impacts, but also in relation to how we de design and deliver uh, community development programs, which are focused on, on delivering uh, positive impacts to our host communities. Um, and so what we're trying to do and, and what we were looking for was a way to help us with, with structuring our approach, not just within the, within the funds that we uh, invest, but within our own uh, company, we've been climate fund managers as well. We were looking for a structured way to, to help us understand where are we at and where can we go and what are the actions that we need to take to get there. And um, that's where the, uh, the, the women's economic principles and the, the tool that Anne-Marie has just mentioned um, really, really come in. 
Um, to the next slide, please, Diana. So why, why use the tool? Well, for us, we wanted to find a way to demystify what it means to m mainstream gender um, for a lot of our colleagues, but also within the companies where we work. Gender is, uh, is a term that many people hear of, but don't really understand uh, quite what it means in practical terms. And so the tool has been extremely helpful in, in helping to um, sort of disaggregate what it means and, and, and help us with formulating definitive uh, actions. Um, it provides us with a clear, consistent and systematic way of assessing uh, the, the gender mainstreaming status within the company, as well as looking at, at, at our project companies, what, what they can be doing. And um, so we have started, we started at the beginning of this year using the tool internally, and we have now committed to updating our assessment every six months because we recognize this is not just a once off exercise, but something that we want to continue to, um, to, to keep alive and uh, ensure that we can continue to monitor how we're progressing. The tool has been really helpful in identifying gaps and solutions and helping us to then put all of that into an action plan that we can then um, track and, and progress with. So I'm very excited to hear um, that there will be a, a monitoring and evaluation framework coming out in December, because I think that's going to be super helpful um, for us internally and also for our, for our project companies as well. Um, the other thing that we are doing, so as well as reporting internally on how we're getting on, so the, the, the management board is aware and we have been delivering awareness sessions to the Clomic Fund Manager's staff. We are also now looking to roll this tool out to our project companies. And we, we started that earlier this year, around uh, six months ago, by rolling it out to our first, um, to one of, to the first investment in the, in the portfolio of Climate Investor One, which is a, a Pan-Asia um, solar um, comp developer. And um, yeah, we've, we're very happy to say that that was very well received. And, um, and off the back of that, we're looking to roll out the tool further over the, over the coming months. Next slide, please. So before I, I move on to what are the, what are the project companies um, saying about this, I thought I would first just um, go through a few of the things that we have started to do as a result of, the, of, of having looked at the tool and, and identified some, some actions. So in relation to our investments, we identified three key areas that we needed to focus on and, and really emphasize. One is understanding that risks and impacts are differentially experienced between men and women, and therefore to look at how to um, better recognize those in the investment process and how to better manage and mitigate those impacts. Secondly, we realized that, that for, to enable equal participation, we need to somehow make sure that, uh, that in the impact assessment process and then ongoing stakeholder engagement, that we, re we react differently to the ways in which men and women um, participate, um, taking into account even the most uh, sort of practical of, of limitations that could prevent a, a woman, for example, from participating because, for, ha for example, she's, she's very busy uh, working at home or, or something like that. So we're, we're trying really actively to make sure we can really be flexible with our approach. And then thirdly, I mentioned the community development programs that we, we implement, and we have a very clear focus on trying to identify what are the opportunities for women and for women's economic empowerment. And that's a, another key, um, key task that we are now also undertaking across all of our um, investments. And then if we move to the next slide, please, Diana, um, we also identified four key areas where we can focus more um, internally, um, first with a, having a, a more gender responsive workplace approach um, by, by creating and, and leading from, from the CEO downwards on what it means to have an equitable workplace where all people are equal, um, ensuring um, policy, uh, policies and principles are very clearly um, adopted and um, embedded in everything we do with regards um, equal pay, uh, equal remuneration, um, equal opportunity as well. 
um, we also want to make sure that we can address and actively do so that the that from the leadership um, team downwards recognize that um, that gender disparity or discrimination on the basis of gender as well as any other um, personal attribute is simply not acceptable and um, the company is, is striving to in, ensure that in in all cases that people are all people are treated equally we're, we're actually really lucky we have a, a, a I think it's over 20 nationalities in uh, represented in our workforce of just over 50 people and um, a really you know strong number uh, equal I'd say almost an even spread between men and women but still there is is uh, always more that needs to be done to um, recognize um, that we, we well that we need more women in leadership positions for example but this is these are just some examples of some of the things that we uh, recognized it's not to say we weren't doing any of these things before because we were but we decided okay let's um, really formulate these in in a, in a documented fashion so we then um, have since um, identifying initially what the key areas were to improve upon We've now prepared a, a standalone gender policy, which is now um, has been endorsed and signed off by the supervisory board. Uh, if we move to the next slide, please, Diana. Um, so this is uh, just the, the final um, final slide I wanted to share, um, and based on some of the actions that we first identified, we've, ident we've, we've now seen that we need to do some um, work to update our human resources policy. Um, we're rolling out the tool to our assets, which I'll, I'll come back to again in a second. We're rolling out additional training to our staff. Um, we're continuing to focus on specific um, aspects that also need to be improved upon, for example, in, in our offices and, and facilities. And we're also de developing a, a sort of toolkit that we can use to deliver both internally, but also to our project companies that helps to, going back to that word demystify, you know, help people to understand what they need to do at the, um, at the project level to understand and um, practically implement gender mainstreaming um, activities. So just finally, in relation to our assets, uh, or rather the, the projects in which we, um, which we, uh, we focus our time, we had um, some feedback earlier this year from, from the first asset I mentioned, the Pan-Asia portfolio. Their, their feedback to us because we asked them, okay, how did you find the tool? Was it useful? They said it's a comprehensive tool covering a good spectrum to analyze women's rights, equality, empowerment, etc., and determine whether they are being taken seriously by an organization. Corrective actions can be made from the results in achieving the eventual objective to improve women's lives and status in society. That uh, that same asset is um, going to be rerunning the, the assessment uh, just a bit later this year. And um, I have to say that uh, so she, that's the human resources manager for the group, and she's super excited about the tool because, again, she really sees the, um, the, the, the benefits it can deliver in terms of, you know, consistency, uh, detail in terms of types of action and so on. And then just to finally share with you, our um, head of human resources at Climate Fund Managers um, also shared some feedback, which I wanted to share with you. Um, he said that the topics and questions covered in the tool have really helped to structure our own approach to gender diversity within the company, as well as in our projects. It has helped to establish a standard that we want to achieve and identify clear priorities for our gender focus. It has helped us establish where we are in the journey, which is um, something that Anna mentioned before, where we want to be and offers guidance on how to get there. The structure enables us to reach people and supports our effectiveness in our communications and in creating support within the organization. So those are just two perspectives, one from us as the fund manager, one from one of our, um, one of our assets. Um, we are now about to embark on rolling the tool out to all our other assets in Asia, first of all, and then in, in parallel to that, we'll be looking at what we can, uh, what, what we do uh, across our across our other regions. 
so very exciting times and um yeah it's uh it is it's a journey as anna mentioned but um you know what we want to do ultimately is is create just and inclusive societies as as anita mentioned at the beginning and this is certainly a, a fantastic tool to help us get there thank you thank you so much claire so um, a rich presentation, but it also was very practical, I think, also for our community and all the participants to understand how this is applied uh, um, daily um, in the uh, work of climate fund uh, managers, but also how we can take an example and see how we can apply it for other companies, especially, as you mentioned, the creation of the toolkits that um, you uh, also applied in work with other partners. So thank you so much. This was very useful. Um, and thank you so much, Anna and Anne-Marie for your presentation and providing also the detailed um, about the women empowerment principles and how FinDev Canada is using especially the GUT tool. We have many questions, and if you don't mind, we will start the session uh, in answering the questions, and um, we will do our best maybe to also um, have some interventions. I see there are some uh, um, raised hands. So let's see if you have a, a particular um, uh, comment or you would like to emphasize something. Um, uh, Shalani and, um, and yes, uh, I, I think another hand was um, already got down. So um, Shalani, over to you. Um, since you have your hand raised, I would allow you to uh, share your opinion or comment. Shalani, if you unmute from your end, you may ask your question or share your comment. Or maybe later. And if not, uh, so we have um, a question about what other DFIs are doing on women empowerment principles, more generally on gender lens investing. Um, maybe Anne-Marie, Claire, over to you for this question. Sure. Um, so what other DFIs have been doing? So there's a lot of uh, action to, and I think this is the question that came through the chat, to scale uh, women's economic empowerment uh, and its integration in DFI and transactions through the 2x challenge. Uh, so the 2x challenge uh, specifically looks at um, the impact, uh, potential, uh, current and potential on uh, women's access to entrepreneurship and finance, uh, women's access to leadership roles, uh, access to quality employment and access to products and services that specifically or disproportionately benefit women. So a lot of work uh, has been done on, on and is, uh, is currently being done on, on this topic through 2X. Stay tuned. So we're approaching the end of our initial commitment at the end of 2020. Uh, so we'll announce the, the final numbers that have been committed and mobilized. We'll also announce very soon a new commitment. So what will the 2X challenge look like uh, after 2020? Uh, and when it comes to the webs uh, themselves, so of course in Canada, we, we try to promote the webs uh, as much as possible with our uh, 2X uh, and other DFI colleagues. We have been on, on transactions together where we've used the webs and uh, they've also uh, find, found, it, uh, found it helpful. Um, so each DFI right now has um, their own tools uh, when it comes to uh, assessing uh, potential impacts on women's economic empowerment, although we are uh, trying very hard to align those as much as possible so that uh, it's as simple and effective as possible for our clients. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Then it was a question about how to maximize women's participation. Um, Anna, maybe over to you. Sure, thank you so much. Um, yeah, welcome this question because it is, uh, of course, uh, depends on the sector, uh, what's the starting point. We often talk about the critical mass of women, uh, which is about 30%, for then it, it'd be um, rolling out systematically once you achieve the 30%. But 
broadly, uh, without going into any sectoral issues or, or the size of the company, uh, women are attracted to um, companies that have policies and practices that are inclusive and that promotes diversity and uh, that has that culture of, of um, inclusion and, and diversity. Uh, they're also attracted to um, companies that allow um, women and, and men to balance the family responsibilities. So if um, we, we know, for example, by in recruitment, if uh, both women and men can take parental leave and paternity and maternity leave, uh, we know um, that there will be less discrimination against women when it comes to both recruitment, but also in terms of promotion at a, at a later stage. And if men are equally involved in picking up their, their children at daycare or at school or wherever they might be, or to stay home and take care of, of the child when they're um, infants, that also foster that culture of inclusion and diversity because um, there would be a removal of the discrimination that otherwise in the recruiter's mind would say, oh, but this woman might uh, take uh, patern uh, maternity leave uh, or parental leave. And uh, therefore she, she will not be able to stay uh, for X amount of time. But if we equalize that between women and men, it's uh, much easier um, and, and it removes that form of discrimination. So we have on our website a lot of resources on different topics, on parental leave, on uh, equal pay, on sexual harassment and other areas where we uh, really kind of talk about and, and guide on the workplace that work for everyone and the workplace that uh, attracts and, and maximize women's participation. So I hope that responds to, to that question. I'm happy to take more. Thank you so much, Anna. Uh, we received uh, um, a lot of questions about the, um, whether the, this recording and the presentation will be shared. Yes, dear participants, we would like to assure that within 24 hours, we will share the recording and the presentation. So, and all the links to the tools were mentioned by Claire and Marie, um, Anna, and also in the opening remarks by Paolo and and Anita. Um, so um, Sener is thanking all the panelists for a great uh, presentation. Um, she found it very ed educational. And there are two questions, maybe Claire, you would like to take those. Based on your experience, what are the tools to ensure that women participation by number or by impact relative, uh, re relative to beneficiaries of men is maximized? And also, is there any risk in differences between what private sector promises before financing versus what happens in reality after financing financial um, process is closed? Thank you very much um, for the question, Sina. Sorry um, for the bad pronunciation. I'm sure it is bad. Um, I'll answer the first question first. Uh, sorry, the second question first. Um, is there a risk that uh, pre-financial uh, close that things are, are kind of said and, and, and everything sounds great and, and then afterwards um, nothing really happens for sure? <laughs> um, which is where um, where where we have um, a really important role to play because um, we of course are also making commitments to to our investors such as Findev Canada and others and we tell them yes we uh, we focus on mainstreaming gender and and this is a, a core um, focus for us. Um, they they expect us to be to come true, <laughs> and um, and of course we we want to, um, and so we we hold ourselves to account, um, and we report back to our investors on a routine basis to tell them how we're doing and, and what we're doing, and we also then expect our project companies to be held to account, and so we will you know, hopefully see that filtering down effect that, um, that I, I think was, was mentioned earlier by, by some of the other panelists. So, you know, we want to, we want to see this effect being uh, 
being felt right at the at the coalface or you know right within the communities and within the project companies who are employing women or could be looking to employ women so so that's super important and then we want to be able to report all the way back up again and see how we can engage in a process of continuous improvement and not everything happens immediately and i'll go back to what what anna mentioned it it is a journey for sure um and we we recognize that we have an important role to play, but we're not the only ones. Um, in relation to the, the first question, how do we, um, sorry, and let me just go back to, to what the question was. Um, how do we um, look at what, what the targets are for, um, for increasing the number of women that are involved, for example? Well, I mean, we don't really set targets as such, but we do um, we do seek to ensure that in all of the different things we're doing, as I mentioned before, stakeholder engagement, um, the impact assessment process, um, and, and, and many other, uh, other aspects of developing a project, plus then constructing a project through the local employment um, procedure and so on, that women are given as much opportunity as men. <clears throat> what we don't want to do is somehow prescribe a number of people who, you know, of different of different genders that should be applying because that's not really going to work in reality. And we also need to be really cognizant of the the, sort of the context in which the project is located. In many of the uh, areas where we work, um, women simply are not so involved in paid labour. They tend to be more home uh, homekeepers or working um, on working on their on their land and they're they actually we I mean we will always ask them about what what would be their their ideas about getting for example work within a project often they don't want to but that's not the point the point is that we ask the questions and um, seek to then look at what other opportunities could there be where we can um, deliver opportunities to them or at least help to deliver um, benefits from the project that will help improve uh, their their livelihoods and, and their quality of life. I don't know if I've answered the question very well. I think it's um, so important to treat each case on its merits and there certainly isn't a one size fits all and we work across so many different geographies that um, that, that needs to be um, the reality. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claire. And we know that um, we all are very busy and we have Zooms um, meetings and events. Uh, so we would like to be respectful of a time. But since we have two, three, four, five minutes, let's say, I would share several questions and I would like all the panelists to take a round and to share final remarks and maybe choose the question what they would like to respond. So um, Shayla is saying this is a very practical and inspiring session to assist both partners and show of how to begin. Thank you, Sheila. Um, a question we have is um, to what extent is violence against women integrated as a topic during the assessment? We also have a question from Karaki, Pakistan. How can we collaborate and increase the impact on women empowerment? Then we have a question on how do CDFI promote women inclusive development, especially women with disability and also smallholders farmers. And also, um, I'm trying, I'm trying to see um, how to empower women to this current community in the times of COVID, since we still are in this um, challenging times and how can webs uh, uh, can guide the company with decision making during pandemic. So I obviously generalize the question, but um, I would appreciate if the panelists will uh, share maybe some reflection on, on this. And um, maybe we can start with um, Anne-Marie and then Claire, Anna, and uh, if Paolo has some minutes, we would love to, to sh um, if he can share some closing conclusion as well. Over to you, Anne-Marie. 
Thank you, Diana. I'll try to be brief. Maybe I'll take the, the COVID uh, question because obviously it's very uh, top of mind. Uh, I think the key here is to uh, really bring it back uh, to the context of the company. And that's also, uh, I think, part of it. I saw another question about this in the chat, you know, um, that Anna answered earlier about how do you maximize the impact on women? To me, it's really about first understanding the, the context uh, where the company finds itself in. Uh, so, for example, with COVID, uh, you know, we know that a lot of companies are not going to hire a lot of people uh, in the very short term. You know, on the contrary, they're kind of trying to sometimes um, uh, try to avoid uh, retrenchment and save, save jobs. Um, so in these contexts, it's not necessarily about uh, trying to increase the proportion of women in the workplace by hiring uh, new, uh, new people, but more focusing on what kind of support is the company currently offering its employees? Uh, and can we you know, apply a gender lens to this? What kind of improvements? How can we help them um, improve their work-life balance with their caregiving responsibilities at home in a way that they're also able to uh, continue working for us? So bringing it back to the, the context of this, what this company is in a best position to influence at this uh, point in time. And very quickly, if you'll allow me, I also saw a question about a scorecard for if the Canada is thinking of doing a, a scorecard on the web for its clients. It is something we are thinking about. We would love to be able to show our clients where they stand compared to other FinDev Canada uh, uh, clients in the future. A little bit like I encourage everyone to go and see on the web website, there's a, a global trends report uh, with anonymized results from all over the world. Um, so we would love to be able to do that. Our portfolio remains a little bit small at the moment. We're a small institution, so we want to make sure we're able to do that by respecting also confidentiality of the, of the results. But I think we are uh, just a few, uh, maybe a few more months before we're, we're able to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Claire, over to you for some reflection on the questions and some closing remarks from your side? Um, so, well, first of all, um, <laughs> I, it was fantastic to see so many, so much interaction and so many questions um, and comments coming through. It's really, it's really nice to see how engaged everyone is in this. And I don't think I'm going to do uh, anyone um, a good service by trying to, to answer them all in, in such a short amount of time left. That's my way of getting out of answering any of the questions, perhaps. But um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I first of all um, think that we probably we are seeing um, a setback as a result of COVID-19 um, for sure and that is a, a major uh, you know that's that's a, a big shock to to the to the global system that we are going to have to work really hard to overcome and certainly one of the aspects we're looking at in our projects is what does what what does this what does COVID mean in relation to what we're already doing? It's, it's resulted in delays, for example, in in looking at community needs assessments, in in developing gender action plans for our projects, because we've just simply not been able to mobilise people to site. Existing community development programmes have been largely put on hold, and many of those do have a, a women focus. And so that has resulted in quite a big impact on those um, intended beneficiaries. And, and I think we'll see the sort of the shockwaves from this, this uh, pandemic um, continue for quite a long time. And so we're going to have to make sure we try really hard where we can to um, look at what those, those individual impacts are across our different projects and see how we can put in place activities and uh, and, uh, and, and make make funding available to help support um, you know the, the communities that are affected. We are actually um, in de delivering a, a series of, of funding to individual um, countries and, and governments to support with the COVID-19 relief effort. But we know that the recovery will take much much longer, and, and that's what we know we need to also focus on. Um, I don't know if the rest of the questions will if. Perhaps they'll be made available afterwards. Yes, 
Yeah. Yes, we will. We will share all the questions and we see the discussion going. And um, we had actually a great compliment. And, and until we have um, everyone, I would like somebody mentioned. I think Senior said you made our day. Thank you to all of you, do a participant. You made our day and our week because you are joining and you're participating in the discussion and so actively asking your questions and um, you sharing with us that we need to be proactive, meaning all of us as a community. This is um, beyond, you know, that it, it's, it's uh, um, going from advocacy to action and this is what we want to achieve. Anna, over to you for your remarks and um, at the end of this session. Yeah, thank you, Diana. And there were a lot of questions packed in there. I, I think uh, the one that wasn't uh, tackled was the ending violence against women. So I'd like to just uh, quickly highlight that uh, violence uh, is incorporated in principle three. Um, and we have also, for those that are interested, some guidance on the website on uh, specific tackling domestic violence during COVID-19. So that I think can be quite helpful. Um, I'd also like just to say that it is in, in regards to the question on the uh, targets, it is not about uh, making all the companies the same uh, achievers at the same point of time. It is um, about encouraging progress. So as long as companies are moving in the right direction, we know that some of these issues are quite challenging. We would like to see that progress is made um, and, and we are not looking to say that everyone next year needs to have 50-50 women and men. It takes time. Uh, it is um, changing social norms, changing culture takes time and it's not something that we achieve um, instantly. So we, we do understand that. Uh, finally, um, we have started the polls. So please respond to the poll. Um, um, I'd like to also call attention to a survey that we have out uh, where we are calling for good practices on what companies have been doing during COVID-19 to respond to gender um, equality issues. Um, and how to support uh, women in, within the companies, in the supply chain, in the communities. So um, we can share the link with everyone that participated afterwards and we really encourage everyone to submit their uh, contributions. It will form part of a report that we will launch in December um, that would highlight these um, examples. So um, we will share with you the link um, after the event and we welcome everyone to um, contribute to that. Thank you. And Thank thanks you. everyone for being so active and, and lots of questions. We'll try our best to, to respond to them. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Anna. Uh, Paolo, you've been with us entire session and you kicked us off with uh, opening remarks. What would be one takeaway that you would like all of us uh, to go um, after this session? Thank you, Diana. Just, first off, I want to say thank you to, to everyone, all of our partners here and, and, uh, and uh, all of our guests, obviously, for, for sharing that, you know, the important work that they're doing. I think that the, I'll, I'll go back to, the, you know, the, the final sort of comments that I had in my opening comments about sort of we can't, we can't sort of do this together. We can't just sort of talk to ourselves about, what, you know, what a good job that we're doing. We have to sort of get out there and, and, and get the word and get, get stuff done, right? We, we talked a little bit about how, you know, how we work with our clients, we're taking them on a journey and it's okay, they're not at the destination, but let's work with them, right? We have different tools and, and different, uh, different teams and team members, at least at FinDev Canada, to help work with them. And that, that's what we do. Um, and so we want to sort of encourage others and, and, and work with us, contact us um, and, uh, and let's, uh, let's, let's deal with this. Let's, let's, <laughs> um, yeah, let's deal with it. Let's get her done. Thank you so much, Paolo. I am doing my best to actually also include um, the information about the next events. 
but um, before uh, inviting you all to participate to our next event, I would like to share a big thank you to um, Anita Batia, DAD of UN Newman, Paolo Martelli, Chief Investment Officer, FinDev Canada, our speakers today, Anna Feld, Head of Women Empowerment Principal Secretariat and Project Manager of We Empower G7 Project, Anne-Marie Lavesque, Head of Gender and Impact, FinDev Canada, and Claire Cummins, Head of Environmental, Social and Governance, Climate Fund Managers. Thank you so much. It was a very useful session for all of us, those who presented, those who shared the presentation, and those who participated in the discussion. Also, special thanks to Elisha and Natasha for uh, keeping uh, all of us active and in a chat mode. Thank you to our um, colleagues from communication department. Thank you to everyone that made this event possible because it's a teamwork. And as it was mentioned during the entire um, session today, we can only do this through multi-stakeholder dialogue and through partnership. Please join our next event on mentoring on 27 October. And if you have any additional questions on this topic, we will still collect them. So please um, share the question via webs at uanuman.org. We'll be happy to respond. Thank you, everyone, and have a great week. Goodbye. Thank you.